Previously on Joseph and His Brothers. Joseph was his father's favorite. And God gave him a dream that he would one day be a great leader and even his own family would bow down to him. Well, that made his brothers jealous, so they threw him in a pit and sold him as a slave, and he wound up being lied about, betrayed, and thrown into a prison for a very long time. Will Joseph get out of prison? Will Joseph save the entire nation? I'm not talking about that nation, I'm talking about Egypt. Will Joseph's dreams come true? Well, let's find out on another exciting episode of... Joseph and his brothers. Starring Joseph and his brothers. Hey, Pharaoh, I heard you had a weird dream recently. I happen to know a guy who can tell you all about it. It was crazy, so that would be much appreciated. Uh, it was a guy I met in prison. I want to say his name was, uh, uh, Joseph? Guards, go get me Joseph. Get out of the way! We're bringing Joseph to the Pharaoh! Oh, hey, Joseph. All my advisors over there are idiots, so they couldn't tell me what my dream hey, means. What does mean? I'm well, God tells me what other people's dreams mean. So I can tell you what your dream means if you just tell me a little bit about it. Oh, Joseph, that would be so nice of you. So it starts out like this. Seven, seven healthy cows are coming from the ocean. They're roaming around, as you can see. Just normal. And then seven ugly cows come and devour those other cows. And that's what happens in that dream. Hmm, let me just think about that for a second. So your dream means that you're going to have seven years of good food, seven years of good cows and good crops, you see. And then the seven years that follow that, you're just not going to have enough. There's going to be a famine. So you should store about one-fifth of everything that you get so that you can last the remaining seven years of, of this 14-year dream prophecy thing. Mm-hmm. Good, Joseph. Why don't you just be in charge of all of that? That would be great. Ooh. Introducing Joseph, sickening command of Egypt. Hey, whoa, 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 no, no, no. I am still first command. He is only second command. Then the great seven years of plenty happened, followed directly by the seven years of famine, in which people came from all around the entire nation of Egypt, as well as surrounding countries, to come and get food. You'll never guess what happens next, unless you already know the story, then you probably do. Hey, you guys know where I could get a pork chop sandwich around here? You're Jewish, you can't even eat that. Hey guys, I saved a bunch of money on my camel insurance. So I hear that you guys need some food. Yeah, I don't really know how this works or anything, but we're like kneeling on the floor and... Can you just give us some food? <gasps> oh my gosh, those are all my brothers that threw me in a pit and that sold me as a slave and now they're all bowing down to me and oh my goodness, Gad gained weight. <laughs> oh, my head hurts from all these dreams coming true. Let's see how long it takes them to figure out that I'm their brother, Joseph. Um, if only I could think of some kind of elaborate plot to make them figure it out on their own. So then Joseph enacted his elaborate plot for his brothers to figure it out on their own, sending them back home and then back to Egypt again to join them at a feast where he would eventually, elaborately explain his true identity. Hey guys, I'm Joseph. <gasps> oh man. Dead. <gasps> oh snap! The brothers went back home to get their father so he could see Joseph again, which brings them back all as a family to Egypt. What did you learn today? Well, I think that because of all the bad things that happened to Joseph, God used it for good because Joseph was used by God to save an entire nation and even our whole family from this terrible famine. So I'd have to say the moral of the story is if you follow your dreams and your life gets hard, don't worry because God We'll use it for good. So that concludes the final installment of... <laughs> Joseph and his brothers. Starring Joseph and his brothers. What's going on, Crossley Church? How you doing tonight? Hey, can we just say hello to, to Big Lake and Zimmerman real quick? Can we say hello to those guys? 
Okay, so my, 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 uh, my daughter says to me, Dad, can we have a cartoon every week in church? No, we're done with that. <laughs> so we are kind of done with the story of Joseph and his brothers, except I want to do one final piece of this. But to get you to the solution, to the kind of conclusion of Joseph's story, here's what I have to do first. I have to talk to you about the gospel story. Everybody say the gospel story. Now, the gospel story is basically this, that the centerpiece of the Bible is the cross. It is, it is the centerpiece of the word, word of God. Man, and before that, there was, there was pain and suffering and trials and death and ruin and victims and, the, and, and injustice and hurt. This is kind of before the cross and including the life of Christ. Think about the life of Christ for a second. It was full of suffering and pain and trials and death and ruin, and he was a victim, ended up at the cross. There's injustice and hurt. But then there's this moment after the cross where the, you know that whole grave thing and it, the stone, like, it rolled away, and then there was this guy, and he, three days, and he got up, and, like, he was alive again. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, okay, so there's a second piece to the gospel. It's not all pain and suffering and trials and death. <laughs> there's a second part to it. There's, oh, there's good news. Everybody say good news. good news. There's good news to the story of the gospel. Also, there is salvation, and there was a payoff, and triumph, and life, and resurrection, and there's a victor, and there's a crown, and there's increase, and there's hope. Now, here's what I want you to understand. See, many people in many churches think, man, we got to focus on the fact that being a Christian is hard. There's suffering, and there's pain, and there's trials, and there's hurt, and yes, that's true, but that's only half the gospel. There's another side to the gospel story too. If it wasn't for a cross, there wouldn't be over here on the other side, a crown. If it wasn't for pain, you wouldn't get to a payoff. If it wasn't for the death of Christ, you wouldn't have a resurrection. And what many Christians want to do is they want to focus on how hard their life is. And if you're a Christian, you're going to get persecuted and how bad it is. It's going to be awful to be Christian. Here's, there's lots of reward for this. It's going to be pain and suffering. But that's not the whole story. The gospel is good news. And the other side of the coin is there's a crown, there is hope, there is victory, there's life, there's peace, there's joy. There's a second chance. That's the gospel story. Is that good news? So we've already talked about this side of the cross. See, because Joseph is a type of Christ. We've talked about his trials and his tribulation and his suffering. But there was a moment where Joseph moved past injustice and moved on to increase. There was a moment when he went from all of this pain and all of this hurt and all of this victimhood, and he was, there was a moment when all of a sudden, oh, he was past it, and he had moved on to something better. He'd moved on to increase. And the way the increase is described in Scripture is he was made second in command of Egypt, he, he saved Egypt and the surrounding countries from starvation. Uh, he forgave his brothers. He moved his family to Egypt, and he took care of them. This is kind of the story of, of what happens, that just like Jesus, there was a new life for Joseph. There was joy for Joseph. There was peace. There was hope. There was blessing. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, some of you, this is kind of what went through my mind. I'm reading this right. I wonder when Joseph first, it first dawned on him, oh, my gosh, my, my life's going to get good again. After, you, you, everybody, if you've been through something really, really painful, it feels like it's never going to get good again. And there's this moment for the first time that that thought hits you. Oh my, oh my gosh. There, there's going to be good again. Something good is going to happen in the midst of all this injustice, in the midst of all this pain. Uh, there, I'm going to come out on the other side and this is going to, th this might be even better. And we don't know when Joseph first had that thought, but I do know when Joseph first said that thought, and that's in Genesis chapter 41, verses 50 and 51. It just says this. It says, two sons were born to Joseph by the daughter of Potiphar, the, the priest of On. Joseph named his first son Manasseh. And this is what Manasseh means. It is because God has made me what? Forget what? Um, they, God actually got him to the place where he forgot his past. Isn't that a good, a good thought? That after all this pain and all this hardship and all this misery, there was a moment where like, hey, God's the God who got me past all my past. I can have something better again. And then he has a second son, and he names him Ephraim. Keep going. He has the second son, and he names him Ephraim. And this is what Ephraim means. And it means, and because God has made me, what? 
which means prosperous, successful, and increased in the land of my suffering. See, I want you to understand that there was a moment when average Joe went from injustice to increase. That there was a moment, just like Christ went from death to resurrection, there's a moment where your pain's gonna end. We don't have to talk about that anymore. We don't have to talk about the hardship and the trial and the suffering and the fiery trial. And you're in the hand of God and it's going to be painful. And we don't talk about that anymore. Why? Because there's going to be a moment when that's going to be the past and the future is going to be bright again. This is the whole story of the gospel. That yes, there's a death, but there is also a what? A resurrection. Come on, say Resurrection which means something for you. You're gonna move past your injustice and you're gonna move on to increase. You're gonna move past your injustice and you're gonna move on to increase. Remember, Joe is just average Joe. He's just average Joe. He's just average Janet. And just like Joe got past his trial and then thrived, you're gonna get past yours and you're gonna thrive again. That is the gospel story. That's what I want to talk to you about this weekend. Can we do that, church? Yeah. Cool. I'm going to I, I invite you to, on the back of every chair to get out a note sheet and to, to take some notes if you'd like. I'm going to pray in a second, but I'm just going to throw this, this out before I, I, I pray. Um, so next week we were supposed to start a series. I, I don't know what it was called or whatever, and I just I woke up last Sunday morning. I'm not even kidding you. Last Sunday morning, after we'd advertised it on Saturday night, I woke up on Sunday morning and at 5 a.m. and was like, God does not want us to do this series. So I looked over at my wife, I woke her up. I don't think God wants us to do this here. We have to do something else. And she goes, I agree, I don't think we should do it. I'm like, crap, now I have to change it. <laughs> so then I, then I called Pastor John, and John goes, good, I didn't want to do that series either. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so then I asked Pastor Ted, and he's like, oh, we've done all this research, and I've got all this stuff ready, and we're, we're kind of in the process already. But if you really believe God wants us to change it, I think we ought to change it. And I went, okay, fine. So next week we are changing, this is the first time in the history of the church this has ever occurred. I want to walk by faith and not by sight. And so I want to be spirit-led as a church and not program-led. And so next week we are starting a series that I never thought I was going to preach, that I never thought I was going to do, and I think it's really coming out of this series. We've come out of the story of suffering and moved to salvation. Next week I want to talk to you about the year of faith. We're going to talk to you about how you can believe the gospel story and then see this become reality in your life. That's what we're going to start next week. I want you to come back. I want you to hear this because I believe God led us to what we're going to talk about next week. This week, I want to talk to you about hope and salvation. Next week, I want to talk to you how you believe the whole picture to walk into that. Does that make sense? So let me pray and we'll do it. Jesus, I thank you for what you're about ready to do in here. I thank you for every life. I ask that you would bless every heart, both here in Zimmerman and Big Lake, God, I just ask for, for, for your peace, your presence, and your power to fall. I pray that as we look at the hope that is found in the gospel, not just the pain of the gospel story, but the hope of the gospel story, that you would bring hope into every heart and that those people in here that feel like their pain is going on forever, that they would hear the truth that their injustice will pass and that there will be a moment when increase happens. I pray that you bring that about to every life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray everybody said. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to start with a verse from the book of Psalms. This is kind of where this started for me in the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms says this. It says, who, O oh God, is like you? Though you've made, made me see troubles. There's the one side of the cross. Many and bitter. You will, what's the next word? Restore my life again. You see how he says that with hope? There's confidence. Like, I, like you're going to restore my life again. It's going to get good. From the depths of the earth, notice he was at like the depths of the earth, meaning like the grave. You will again bring me what? You're going to bring me up. Death, resurrection. You will, what's the next word? Increase my honor and comfort me once again. So when's that going to happen? When when am I going to feel that? When am I going to know that I'm actually moved from from injustice to increase? How am I going to know that? How am I going to feel like it's actually happened? And the answer to that, I think, is threefold. And that's really what I'm after today. I want you to understand, finally, when you feel like, oh man, I think I'm actually to the good place. I'm actually to the good place that was always talked about in scripture. I think I'm finally there. I think I'm, I'm starting to arrive. I think I'm starting to, like, I, I, there are three things that are gonna occur in your life when you begin to feel like you have moved to increase. The first one is you're gonna dream again. Everybody say dream again. See, the truth of the matter is your pain will destroy your dreams, doesn't it? 
If you go through divorce or you go through cancer or you go through a, a breakup like that video I was talking about earlier, or you go through whatever you want to throw, job loss or foreclosure or whatever, you begin to believe this is what it's going to be like forever and my dreams don't matter and my future isn't going to happen and I'm just going to live like this forever. Don't you start to feel that way? But you know you've started to move past it when you start to dream again. You start to think, man, like, I, I think this is going to be good. Like, I can, I can see a future for this relationship. I could see a future in this career. I can see a future past my cancer. I can see a future past addiction. I got, oh, my gosh, my, my kid's getting free of what he's in, and, like, he's going to have a good life. And you, and you start to, there's some verses in the book of Habakkuk. Everybody say Habakkuk that kind of echo this thought. And I'm gonna spend all three of my points to come out of the book of Habakkuk this weekend. And I'm gonna start with this verse right here. It's Habakkuk chapter two, verse two. It just says this. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. What's he supposed to do? Write it. He's supposed to write it down. He's supposed to what? Write it. Maybe you should write down your dreams. I don't know. It's just like maybe, that just seems like what he's saying. Maybe you should write down the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. And by the way, the NIV, it's a different, little bit different translation, says, so that a herald may run with it. What's a herald? A speaker, a preacher. So you should write it down and speak it often. You know you're finally past your pain and you're moving to something better when you have new dreams, they're written down and you're talking about them all the time. Oh man, like, like this is what's happened. This is what's gonna come. This is what's gonna occur. This, I know there's no what's gonna happen. Like, like uh, one of my pastor friends says, you know you're moving on to a great future when you're saying it and spraying it, wheeling it and dealing it and making other people feel it. When you have moved on and you're thinking future-minded, your brain's not in the past any longer, you're not thinking about your pain anymore, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is gonna occur, this is what's gonna happen next. I know what the future holds, and it's gonna be really, really good. When that starts coming out of your mouth, you know you're moving past your pain. Are you hearing me? Think about the conversations you have with your friends. Are you still focused on your pain all the time, or have you moved on to new dreams? If you stop speaking negative about your past and start believing God's got something good for you and you walk in it and you speak it and you talk about it and you, you're telling everybody else and you just can't shut up and maybe you're like Tom Cruise and you're on the couch and you're jumping up and down. <laughs> See, I want you to understand that that means that you're past whatever was before and there's something new in store for you. See, and I know this from experience. I have had moments where I felt like my dreams were crushed, were broken, felt shattered. And then there was moments where I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna speak negative about this, and so I'm just gonna speak positive, and, or I'm not gonna say anything at all. And then, and then there came a moment where it was irrelevant to me now, and all of a sudden that past was just like, eh, meh. Everybody go, meh. That's what happened to Joseph. He forgot his past. It was like, meh. And all he could speak was the future joy and the peace and the blessing that he knew was coming his way in Christ. See, this is the gospel story. There became a moment where the disciples no longer were like, oh my gosh, Jesus died. And they were like, yes, he rose again. And when they talked about the death, they always included the resurrection. Are you hearing me? So what if you wrote down your dreams? and started talking to your spouse and your kids. But, but, but that seems so scary if I tell somebody else what I think might happen in the future, like and what, my, what, what God good plans for me might be. Like, like if I start saying that kind of stuff, well, I'll, I'll look stupid and people, like, there's gotta be somebody that you can trust, that you can begin to speak about the future that you believe is God's gonna bring to pass. You just gotta write them down and speak them. I put on that sheet of paper, uh, when we started our church eight years ago, I wrote down a whole bunch of dreams. I did. I said, these are the dreams I think God has for the Crossing Church. And uh, over the course of the past, I don't know, year or so, I, I began to dream new dreams. Started with a, 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 new, a, a new vision statement for the church. Crossing is a church that thrills people with God's grace and moves them to life in Christ. And then that led us, led me to new dreams for our future for new thoughts about what, what, what the, where the church is going and where we're headed. And what you have on the sheet, I thought, you know what, I'm going to write them down like Habakkuk says, and I'm going to speak them to you. 
Now, they're not going to show up on the screen, so if you want to see me, I have to actually look on the sheet of paper. God-given dreams for the Crossing Church. I believe the Crossing is going to be a church of 10,000 worshipers in multiple locations all over the state. I believe it. I have no doubt it's going to occur. God gave us that dream. God gave us that vision years ago. It's going to happen. I believe that 2013 is going to be the greatest year of favor and blessings and miracles this church has ever seen. Now, I'm going to talk to you more about why that statement is so important, why 2013 is so valuable in the middle of this. When I get to the second point, I'm going to come back to that. Three, or the third part, I believe that this, church, that this year is going to be where we're going to complete our building project in Elk River. The, the electrical has been run this week. It's all, all running through the ceiling, and they're almost done with the electrical box over there. And the, 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 once that's occurred, then in the next couple of weeks, they're going to break down on a, on a huge lobby off the back of this place. When the lobby is done, they're going to transform all of our kids' space. It's going to get all redecorated and redesigned. And they're going to get new bathrooms that actually look good. Yes, I'm excited about that. And then they're going to start working on the auditorium. And this auditorium is going to go from 500 seats to basically 900 seats on a slope floor. All this is going to occur sometime in the next six to eight months. Guys, God's doing it. It's happening. We're in the process of it already. I believe 2013, we're going to see the greatest number of people worshiping and baptized and following Jesus that we've ever seen. Uh, I, I believe the people of the crossing are going to become strong and bold soul winners who bring their friends to Christ. I believe you're going to get strong and you're going to get bold and you're going to tell other people about Jesus and you're going to help, help them find Christ. I believe the people of the crossing are, are going to bring the tithe in faith out of a heart of love and gratitude. I'm just going to say this, like, people talk about like, giving in church, and when, it, when giving is browbeat into you, you're not interested in giving. But when you know God is good, and he'll meet your needs, and he's going to take good care of you, do you become generous? Yeah, because God takes care of you, and he meets your needs, and he's good to you. And the evidence that you believe God is good is generous giving. When you finally go, oh my gosh, I believe he's really good. I believe he's really going to take care of me. I believe he's really going to meet my needs. Then suddenly you have an open hand and an open heart with your wallet. And I believe this is what God's after in your life. Every week I'm going to preach it from the stage. I believe that's what God's after with your life. That's what he's after in my life. That's what he was after with, with, with Christ. I mean, he gave Christ the ultimate sacrifice just because he loved you. Believing in God's goodness will lead to a generous giver. I believe this for you. By the way, um, I don't just believe this. This is my prayer list for uh, 2013. I was with Pastor Jason at the Zimmerman campus the other day, and he's like, are you going to keep praying? And I'm like, I'm not done with the list yet. <laughs> and I just pray over these dreams and this, this thought and this what God's going to do and how God's going to change lives and how God's going to grow people and how God's going to bless people. And I, I, I believe this, and so I speak it and I pray it often. This is what I own for 2013, and next year I'm going to write a new one, and I'm just going to keep praying over this stuff. I believe the people of the crossing are going to bring the tithe. I believe that more, more addicts will find freedom from addiction this year than any year in the history of the church. This last week we had 214 people in addiction ministry getting free from hurts, habits, and hangups. God's doing awesome stuff with that and three campuses. I believe God's going to bless us with new small groups to help people stay connected to faith outside of the weekend service. Just so you are aware, we have several new groups starting in the, but several, like we have literally, I think we're going to probably have like a hundred new groups happening in the next couple of weeks. It's going to be ridiculous, all that God's doing with that. I believe God's, God's going to overcome demonic strongholds in our lives and do miraculous healings in our bodies physically. I believe this because God is the God who heals. And I believe our addictions are going to be broken, our finances are going to be restored, our kids are going to love Jesus, our careers are going to move, up, move ahead, and our future is going to see what? Favor. What's it going to see? Favor. It's going to see favor. I walk in faith in this. These are the dreams I have for the crossing, the dreams I have for your life, for your marriage, for your kids, for your future and mine. So you know you've moved past... Whatever hurt or hang up you had, whatever pain you suffered, when you're dreaming again, when you're thinking about your future again, what's your future? What if you wrote it down and made it plain and started saying it and spraying it, wheeling it and dealing it and making people feel it? I would guess you could walk into a great future. Are you hearing me, church? But I'll give you a secondary thought. I'll give you a secondary thought. Not only will you dream again, you will, you'll begin to pray again. Now some of you are going, but I pray all the time, man. I pray all the time. Are you praying all the time about your past pain? 
or your future victory. See, people are past their past when they don't even need to pray about it anymore because they know God already took care of it. When their prayers are future-minded and they're thinking about what's God gonna do next and how's he gonna, how's he gonna help us in this and how's he gonna bless us or are your prayers all like, I don't know what's gonna happen, I don't know how it's gonna work. So like the way you know you're past it is when your dreams are, when your prayers are past it too. Are you hearing me? See, there's a, there's a, there's a guy that I respect. He's a pastor, and he's, he, one of the things he says is this. God does not a- answer 100% of the prayers we don't pray. God does not answer 100% of the prayers we don't pray. So I was watching a, a, a television series the other night, and the guy got cancer, and his solution to cancer um, was to become a drug dealer. Some of you know what show I'm talking about. <laughs> His solution to cancer was, I will be a drug dealer. (laughs) Why wouldn't your solution to cancer be, I'm going to pray till God heals me? See, God has victory for you. He has more for you. He has better for you. He has a future for you. But you actually have to pray it. You have to believe it. You have to think, you know what? God is going to answer my prayer. God is going to come through me. I think it's kind of interesting that Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, the next section of Habakkuk says this. It says, the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. Lord, I have heard about your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in what? Our day, in our time. I heard you did awesome stuff way back in the day. I want to see you do awesome stuff today, right now, in my life, in my future, in my marriage, in my addiction, in my relationship, in my career. I want you to see you do something now. See, God doesn't answer 100% of the prayers you don't pray. But if you do pray, what could occur? See, here's the interesting thing. People say they pray, uh, but they say they exercise too. <laughs> Some of you that exercise are like, what? I exercise. <laughs> That's good. I love that. But most people lie about the amount of spirituality they actually possess. When was the last time your prayers were written out And you were on your knees before God saying, I'm not going to get off my knees until you come through and you answer this. I trust that you're good. I know you're faithful. I know you love me. I know you answer prayer. I'm going to pray this till I see it. When's the last time you prayed like that? Why don't we see miracles today? Because we say we pray, but we don't really pray. I heard it. Pray without ceasing. The people that see great things from God are those that pray great prayers to God. See, I think it's interesting that before the disciples started the church of Jesus, they spent 40 days in prayer, even though Jesus was already alive. They knew he was resurrected, but they didn't go tell anybody. They sat in a room and prayed until the power of the Spirit fell And then when the Spirit of God fell on those 12 people in that little room, and some women too, suddenly miracles started occurring and lives started changing and one day 3,000 people came to Christ because they started with prayer and not just a plan. See, God has more for you. He has a future for you. But sometimes we don't see it because we just don't pray. Instead, we decide we're going to go be a drug dealer instead, and so then we end up dying of whatever. And we never saw the miracle, and nothing ever occurred, and we just kind of live half-lives when we could have seen more. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? So I made out a prayer list and a dream list to God, and one of the things I was saying to God was, was I really want to see this, uh, and I felt like God said back to me in, in prayer one day, I felt like he said, he said, how about 2014? And I said, how about 2013? <laughs> And he said, but what about 2014? And I said, but, but don't you know that you said in Scripture 
that when your child comes to you and says, can I have some bread? You don't give them a rock in return. You give them bread. See, my God is good. And my God answers prayer. And my God wants to be generous. And he wants to bless us. And he wants to give us favor. And so as I pray and you feel like God's not going to answer, pray some more. And pray some more. And remind him he already promised to be good. Now, the trippy thing is I think I felt like God looked back at me and said, well, cool, I can do that. I just wondered if you were going to keep praying. I think God does this for us. But he says, how about later? And you say, how about now? <laughs> and he goes, I just wondered if you were going to keep asking. Is it, is it really important? Is it really valuable? Is it really, is, how much you really want this? See, Scripture says in Mark 11, 22 to 24, it just says this. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to his mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. Notice he said it, he didn't just think it. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he what? What he what? That what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Notice he's speaking it and not just thinking it. He's out loud. Because when you start to speak your prayer, like I think there's one thing about, I'm praying in my head. Are you really? Or are you just kind of in that posture because it feels like a good, like, it's now time to pray in church. Is there anything really going on in there? Or is it just a posture? But when you're speaking your prayers out loud, your mind is now engaged in this, isn't it? Because for it to come out your mouth, you go, your mind has to actually be focused on it when I'm praying my prayer. Most of the time, it is out loud. And I, I, I'll, I'll notice when my mind is disengaged because my lips are going, oh yeah, I was supposed to be praying that. <laughs> and I get back focused again. Keep reading that passage. I like this passage so much. I believe that what he says will happen. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, what's the, I, what, what's the word? I like that word, whatever. But I say whatever. whatever. But I say whatever. Whatever. Whatever you ask for in prayer. Believing you have received it, it will be, what's the word? Sure. There's a story in scripture, or not in scripture, in, in, in Hebrew legend about a, 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 a guy named Honi. And there was, a, there was a drought in the land of Egypt. This is a legend, it's not, it's not in, in the Bible. But there was a, la, a, a drought in the land of Israel, sorry. And, and uh, he, people came to him and said, will you pray that God will take away this drought? And it had, it, had, it had not rained in three years. And he said, I'll pray. He said, but I'm just going to pray. I'm going to believe God till I see it. And the story goes about this, this guy. They call him the circle maker. As he took out a big stick, and he drew a circle in the dirt. And then he got down on his knees in the circle, and he prayed until the rain clouds appeared. And he prayed day in and day out. And people mocked him. It's never going to happen just because you're on your knees in prayer. And he stayed there, according to Israelite and Hebrew tradition, until God actually brought the rain and the miracle occurred. I would ask you, when's the last time you made a circle? In the dirt, in your home, and you stayed there till you saw the miracle of God, till you saw the power fall, till you saw life change, till you saw what is on your heart actually happen. So you're going to move past your pain and you're going to move to something better and I know you're going to move past to something better when you're no longer praying about the pain but you're praying about the future. That what you're on your knees about in this circle is not just God get me past my hurt but bring to pass what I know you have in store for me. People who move on to increase are people who pray. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And I'll give you one more thought and then I'll be done and that'll be this. You, you begin to think long about your good future. Everybody say think long. Come on, say think long. So you know you're past your pain when you're dreaming again and you're praying again and you're not just thinking immediate today. Okay, so God's gonna answer my prayer right now in the next five minutes. But you're thinking, I'm going to pray this until I see this in my lifetime. I'm going I'm to pray it until I see it. And maybe 
your prayer isn't even going to be in your lifetime. Maybe, maybe it's going to happen in your kid's lifetime, but you're going to pray it anyway. Think about the fact that uh, this building that we are in now was originally, uh, I think, a Christian Missionary Alliance church, and those people prayed till they got a building, and they prayed for God to do miracles in this building, and it stayed for years and years and years as a simple little church. And then they moved out, and we were able to buy it and move in, and the prayers those people prayed were answered in the lifetime of this church. And some of their prayers for spiritual growth and people to give their lives to Christ and baptisms and this to occur and that to occur and life change and some of the prayers those people prayed in this room, in this building, were actually fulfilled with this church instead of that one. You gotta think bigger than yourself when you pray. You gotta think bigger than just my life or my wife, but my kids and their kids and my friends, maybe this God's going to answer this prayer with my friends. Or maybe he's going to answer this prayer over here. But I know I have to pray this, and I know God's going to do something, and I'm going to stay here until it happens. One of the things I love, Pastor Craig Rochelle is, a, is, a, is one of my heroes and pastor friends, and one of the things he says is this, we always overestimate what God wants to do with us in the short term. And we always underestimate what God wants us to do, do with us in the long term. Isn't that the truth? Like, I'm going to be a great preacher of the Word of God. I don't even know the Bible yet. <laughs> Maybe you should learn the Bible first. <laughs> Instead of thinking you're going to be an evangelist before 20,000 people tomorrow. <laughs> but after you've learned the Bible, or Joseph, after you've spent years in the prison, at the right time, God's going to move you to the palace. So you've got to stay in faith that the dreams that I have and the prayers I'm praying are gonna come to pass. They just might not come to pass when I want them to come to pass or how I want them to come to pass, but they're gonna come to pass. Does that make sense? Once again, I'm gonna take you back to the book of Habakkuk. Chapter two, verse three says this. For the vision is for and, what's the next two words? The visions, the dreams, the thoughts, the future that you have is for an appointed time. But at the, at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. God didn't lie to you. Though it tarries. What's the next three words? Though it tarries. What's the next three words? Wait for it. Because it will surely come. And it will not tarry. God is never late. He is always right on time. You've got to trust this to be true in order to see the goodness of God, that God has not given up on you, that God has not forgotten you, that God has not failed you, that God has not abandoned you, that after the pain is going to come pay off, it's just going to happen in his time and not mine. See, this is people that actually see a future. They trust that I don't have to see it today. It'd be cool if it happened today. I'm praying because I want it to happen today, but if it doesn't happen till Tuesday, I'm cool too. <laughs> or 2025 or 2055 or 2075 I would remind you that Joseph that not just Joseph but Moses was meant for greatness he thought he was supposed to help free Egypt so he went in and tried to do it his way and he killed a guy <laughs> And then he ended up in the outback for 40 years. He's now 80 years of age, and God comes to him in a burning bush and says, hey, I got a job for you. I want you to go get those people out of Egypt. But he didn't come to him when he was young and dumb and thought he knew everything. He waited until he had some life experience, and he'd been kind of through the, the tribulations and trials of life and kind of bent up and bent down. He was, thought he saw victory and then he saw defeat and it just everything seemed confusing and he couldn't figure out what was going on. It was after a while that God showed up in the bush. But it was just the right time for Israel. It was just the right time for Moses to rise up. It was just the right time for something good to happen in the future. You must have faith that at just the right time your future's gonna happen, your increase is gonna occur you're going to see the goodness of the Lord. Are you hearing me? 
So I got, I got to be done. Um, my, my time is up. But I gave you today, I gave you a puzzle piece. Can you get that out? I gave you a puzzle piece. And while that's getting out, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna read you a verse of scripture. I'm gonna read you a verse from Genesis chapter 50. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about this puzzle. Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25. This is the last thing that Joseph basically says in the Bible. So for a while, he's second in command and he has some kids and he has a great future. But I want you to hear the faith at the end of Joseph's life. And I want you to take Joseph's faith at the end of his life and I want you to apply it to your now. Because you're not at the end of yours. You're not at the end of yours. So I want you to take somebody's life experience. Somebody who's been there, done that. And at the end of his life, this is what Joseph says. He says, soon I'm going to die. Joseph told his brothers. But God will surely come to help you. You see the faith in that? God, I've seen it my whole life. But God, God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. And he'll lead you back to the land he, he solemnly promised to give to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And I'm going to key in on the word promise for a second. See, he held on to the promises of God, knowing full well that even if he wasn't going to see it, somebody else was going to see it. He'll bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath, make a commitment, make a vow. I'm sure that vow wasn't to him, it was to God. I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna trust that you're good, I'm gonna trust that your promises and your faithfulness is gonna happen. I don't have anything to worry about, I don't have anything to fear. You took good care of Joseph, you're gonna take good care of me. And then he said, if God comes to help you and lead you back, no, that's not what it says, is it? What's it say? What's it say? Do you hear the confidence in that? Do you hear the Godfidence in that statement? When God comes to help you and lead, lead you back, hey, don't forget to take, take my body with me. Just, just take it with you. Take it out of here. Don't leave me here. But I know God's coming for you. I know he's coming again. I know he's coming to rescue you. I know he's coming to save you. I know he's coming to bless you. Take the goodness of God that Joseph experienced and believe it. Yeah. It's gonna happen for you. What's that got to do with a puzzle piece, Pastor Eric? <laughs> see, a lot of times we look at the picture in front of us and we can't see the whole piece and all we see is this little puzzle piece and we're like, I don't get how this fits. How does my pain fit? How does my story fit? How does, I don't get how this fits. I don't get how this happens and I still get a good future. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Can I just tell you that God sees the whole picture, not just the individual puzzle piece. Stop focusing on the little tiny piece of the puzzle and focus on your big God who knows the whole picture and he's gonna take good care of you. You're gonna see the goodness of the Lord. When you call, he answers. But say it, when I call, he answers. Why don't you stand to your feet? I took my little puzzle piece and I wrote right on it. God sees the big pick. <laughs> I can trust that my big, co big God can take care of my little piece and it's gonna be okay. Borrow Joseph's faith. Injustice, gonna to lead to increase. After the pain comes payoff. After the cross, there's a crown. Jesus, right now we just ask that people would take their part of the puzzle and they would place it in your hands, trusting you're gonna take good care of them because you know the whole picture. We ask you to bless us and grow us and change us. We ask you to use us. We're gonna stay faithful until we see it. In the name of Jesus, we pray, everybody said.